This is Anthony Jeselnik, Comedy's Dark Magician. I was in Oxnard last night to see Anthony Jeselnik, and his opening joke was so high level, I realized that I wasn't funny. I realized that this dude is a professional at what he does. A lot of the best comedians working today will have an act that consists of a general blend of stories, observations, and non sequitur jokes. However, there are some comedians who will develop an act that is mostly dominated by one-liner jokes, and one of the most popular practitioners of this style is Anthony Jeselnik. Anthony Jeselnik. Anthony Jeselnik. Anthony Jeselnik. Who is Anthony Jeselnik? Some people consider Anthony Jeselnik to be one of the best comedians working today with one of the most unique comedic voices and styles in the business. By the end of this video, you will know exactly who Anthony Jeselnik is, where he came from, and how he became the comedian he is today. I will also share some legendary stories and moments of his. In the world of comedy writing, misdirection is one of the most popular tools when it comes to making a joke funny, and Anthony is a master of misdirection. Whenever I meet a pretty girl, the first thing that I look for is intelligence. Because if she doesn't have that, then she's mine. <laughs> When you watch Anthony live, it's like you're watching a magician do a trick because you genuinely do not know where he's taking you until the very end. Not only that, but within his material are all sorts of taboo topics that most regular people would say there's nothing funny about. Abortion, murder, child abuse. If you think the topic is too dark to talk about, then Anthony will make it his mission to find a clever way to make you laugh at it. Alongside his razor sharp writing and deadpan delivery is a pompous and arrogant attitude that is so over the top you can't help but laugh your ass off at it. Yeah, that sounds about right. Some people think they're a bad person if they joke about certain topics. Lucky for us, Anthony does it for us and we just get to laugh alongside him. With all these characteristics put together, you get comedy's dark magician, Anthony Jeselnik. On December 22nd, 1978, Anthony Matthew Jeselnik was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Anthony and his family lived in a little town called Upper St. Clair, Pennsylvania, which is less than 10 miles away from downtown Pittsburgh. Given the dark and demented nature of Anthony's stand-up comedy act, you'd probably surmise that he had a pretty rough childhood. However, this is not the case. Anthony's parents were Stephanie Jeselnik, who was a stay-at-home mom in charge of the kids, and his father, Anthony Jeselnik Sr., who worked as an attorney in the Pennsylvania Pennsylvania area. Additionally, Stephanie and Anthony had a big happy family of five children, consisting of three boys and two girls. Obviously, they worked very hard to take care of the children, and they were very successful in doing so because now they only have two living children. Alright, alright, I'll stop. Growing up, Anthony also had a relatively normal life where he was raised Catholic and attended public school when he entered his early adolescence. He attended Upper St. Clair High School, and nowadays he is listed as a notable alumni from the high school. While in school, Anthony really started to discover his passion for making people laugh. It started incredibly early too when he was just in elementary school. In fact, he would sometimes risk getting in trouble in school by interrupting the class just to tell a joke. In fact, there's one story where a student was in class with a young Anthony, and the student had announced he was moving to a town that was not held in a very high regard. In response to this announcement to the class, Anthony spoke out and uttered the line, quote, oh, well send us a postcard, end quote. The delivery of this line made the entire class laugh, but it also made the teacher laugh. It's pretty hilarious to think that Jeselnik was taking souls and slinging jokes at such a young age. This led to Anthony having a revelation that he has discussed before where he felt like if he were able to make the teacher laugh as a kid, then it was much less likely for you to get in trouble and that you could get away with anything you wanted to. He's discussed this concept several times on podcasts when talking about making people laugh. Furthermore, in 1997, Anthony Jeselnik would proceed to graduate from Upper St. Clair High School and then immediately following his graduation, he would be accepted into Tulane University located in New Orleans, Louisiana, and thus began his enrollment there in 1998. While at Tulane, Anthony would make friends easily and then become a member of the Alpha Tau Omega fraternity. Anthony would study English literature while at Tulane, and I believe his fascination with the English language and his very surgical approach to writing allowed him to write excellent misdirection jokes later on in his career with a perfect word economy. Before trying stand-up comedy, Anthony originally had aspirations to be a writer and an author who made classic American. 
American novels. But this would change very soon. In his early 20s, Anthony would receive an internship in Los Angeles, California, and after spending time out there, he would then fall in love with the city and start to see that there are many more opportunities for him and his writing ability to take advantage of. Then in 2001, Anthony would graduate from Tulane University with a major in English literature and a minor in business studies. With his recent experience in California, Anthony knew that no matter what he did next, that's where he wanted to be. So he would then move there with the intention of becoming a comedy writer. While living in LA, Anthony held down a job at the bookstore Borders, and this was when he would try stand-up comedy for the very first time. How it manifested itself was while working at Borders, Anthony had read a Greg Dean book on stand-up comedy which drew him to the comedy workshop hosted by Greg Dean located in Santa Monica, California. Greg Dean actually has five different books available on comedy for beginners, so it was certainly one of these five books that got Anthony into the comedy workshop. Anthony then performed stand-up comedy for the very first time at the Belly Room located at the world-famous comedy store in front of all the other members of the class, and it would go really well for him. He actually details his first time trying stand-up comedy, how he got interested in comedy, and what it was like performing. Would you remember your first set? Yes, first set at the comedy store, Belly Room. Oh, you were out here already? Yeah, I never. I started out here, I was here for like a year, and I wanted to be a joke writer. And the first set, I remember killing. I remember being like, oh my god, I know how to do comedy, this is amazing, I just know how to mm -hmm. do this. And I went up on stage like a week later at an open mic and bombed so badly that I had like a panic attack, like I was shaking. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get on stage again for months. I would go to open mics and wait in my car. Anthony's first time was likely the best in his entire class, and for his first time, it seemed to have gone over really well. However, 10 years later, when he would rewatch the set, he said it was otherworldly to him just how bad it was, and how severe the disconnect was between his memory of his first set and what actually happened during his first set. I had one joke in my first act on stage that I ended up using in the Donald Trump roast. Oh, really? So I was like, wow, like I was that good that I could have already had this joke. So I went back and watched it like a year ago, thinking mm -hmm. like maybe there's other gold in there. And it was so awful. Like I remembered it being amazing. Like I remembered killing and being like, I know how to do comedy. Yeah, and it was awful. You're getting that love from the audience. You're like, this feels great. Yeah. Anthony also details how difficult it was coming up and how performing open mics early on in his comedy career was brutal. However, Anthony had a gift with his writing ability and his knowledge of the English language that would certainly come in handy for helping him ascend the ranks of the Los Angeles comedy scene. As Anthony continued to do stand-up comedy, he would eventually be fired from his job at Borders and find a new job as an accounting clerk for the American Western TV series titled Deadwood while performing stand-up comedy at open mics in the evening. In addition to that, Anthony talks about how when he got into stand-up initially, it was because he wanted to get a job writing monologues for a late-night television show, but he eventually realized that he had a much more profitable and independent career in stand-up comedy if he just kept at it. He talks about this very briefly on the Your Mom's House podcast with Tom Segura. Check it out. Well, when you're a comedy writer, you take the host's voice and you make it your own. When you're a comedian, you use your own voice and you hope the host likes it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would write these jokes where they were just like, Jimmy has to be likable to be a host. <laughs> That's so like, my whole thing is like you. not being likable. Yeah. I'm going to make you laugh anyway. Yeah. But like, we can't do this. I remember like a couple weeks in, I was like, I'm going to shape the voice of this show. So originally, Anthony Jeselnik did not have dreams of grandeur getting into comedy, but obviously that changed as he started to find his voice more on stage and enjoying the craft a lot more for himself. Some of Anthony Jeselnik's comedic influences included Todd Berry, David Tell, Jack Handy, Stephen Wright, and Emo Phillips. He has also cited Norm MacDonald as one of his childhood comedy heroes on SNL. Time would go on, and Anthony would continue to grind the open mics and shows in the Los Angeles area, and it wasn't until a few years in when he started to find his voice. In the beginning, a lot of comedians work on their likability, given that it makes appealing to an audience much, much easier. But Anthony talks about how being unlikable for him just seemed way more fun, and how he actually really enjoyed leaning into this dissonance. Here's Anthony talking talking about being unlikable on stage. How did you figure out that being unlikable was actually the way to be? Were you always a piece of shit? I didn't have a choice. It was like I walked on stage, imagine me at 23, you know what I mean, walking on stage with a bunch of other like a lineup full of white guys who looked like uglier versions of me. Right. And then I get up there <laughs> and people hated me right away that I was like, this is interesting. So Anthony actually found a deep sense of enjoyment on stage when he played a kind of heel character. And he picked up on that very early on in his career. It usually takes comedians many years to find their unique comedic voice in the beginning. Given that you're new to a craft, you often sound like your influences more than you do yourself, and it takes time to truly be yourself 
on stage. Louis C.K. took close to 15 years to find his voice, George Carlin took well over a decade himself, but Anthony Jeselnik had an epiphany just two years into his comedy career. He was at an open mic where the audience was a bunch of other open mic comedians. A quick note to remember is that comedians do not usually laugh at mics, but Anthony was on stage and he remembers telling this joke. My girlfriend loves to eat chocolate. She's always eating chocolate and she likes to joke she's a chocolate addiction. She'll be like, haha, keep away from those Hershey's bars, and it's really annoying. So one day I put her in the car and I drove her downtown and I pointed out a crack addict. And I said, you see that, honey? Why can't you be that skinny? <laughs> and... After telling this joke, all the comedians went, ooh, as if a ghost had just entered the room. It would appear that Anthony had just found something very unique with this joke. Given his extensive knowledge of the English language and his syntax mastery acquired from his college degree, he had just discovered his knack for writing misdirection and how the reaction was certainly a positive one from the audience. Anthony also talks on your mom's house about experimenting with being a villain and a heel when on stage and how the audience would react very positively to it for him in the beginning, which led to him continuing to implement it within his act <laughs> let's lean into this if the, let's ah. see if i can make the joke so good that you can hate me and you still have to laugh at it and then i just started following like i would say like i'm the greatest and the crowd would <laughs> laugh and i was like yeah. okay like let me follow this so just a couple years into his career anthony had found his unique comedic voice where he would be unlikable on stage and completely full of himself but his mission was to make the jokes he wrote so good that he'd end up making you laugh anyway this led to a very captivating performance anytime jesselnik took the stage Stage, but it wasn't always easy for him. Because of the unlikable and antagonistic nature of Anthony's onstage persona, when he was coming up and establishing himself, he would find himself having some very tough sets because some crowds did not like the darkness behind his act. Anthony actually details this one time he was working at the Columbus Funny Bone and how it was the worst show he'd ever done. He was doing a bunch of sold out shows on Mother's Day weekend and Anthony knew exactly how bad it might have gotten and he told the owner he didn't think it was a good idea. I'll let Anthony tell the story from the podcast. And it was Mother's Day on Sunday. And I was like, guys, you don't want me on Mother's Day. And they like fly the room. And I was like, call every single person who bought a ticket and tell them who I am and explain it to them. Right. And they were like, we got it. We called everybody. Everyone's there cool. was down. And then I went up and I just, I mean, it was just a train wreck from start to finish. Right away, they're like. And it wasn't, it was also in a way that I was like, you're right. <laughs> Like, yeah. you should never have come here to see me on Mother's Day. Yeah. Like, this yeah. is the worst show. Sometimes I'm like, this is a bad crowd. I'm like, you guys are fine. The problem is me. Yeah. And I have yeah. no plan B. This story was just one of many that would prove that Anthony's style of comedy, albeit very funny and captivating, was an acquired taste for some people. There's actually an old video of Anthony Jeselnik explaining his style, on stage persona, and how he goes about writing. I will show a couple clips of this because I saved this video when I was 19 and just getting into stand-up comedy, and I think that there's some gold nuggets in here for anyone who wants to be a comedian or just enjoys watching comedy. For example, one clip where a girl asks him off stage if he's joking or not, and his response is very funny. I did the show last night and this girl comes to me afterwards and she says, Anthony, you're so funny. But it was tough to laugh because I can't tell if you're being serious or if you're joking. Like, see, this is, this is what I'm yeah. talking about, the seriousness. You're not serious. It's you're pretty like, dry. You're not really like, I love that babies. And I said, well, here's a clue. But I think what gives it away normally is that I'm on stage at a fucking comedy club. <laughs> He then talks a little more about balancing out his offstage personality with his onstage personality and how they're different but also very close. I think this is a really interesting bit of commentary for anyone who's interested in Anthony's style of comedy. How much does my character on stage reflect my personality? It's not me. Like I'm people are like, oh you're really you're a really nice guy, you wouldn't know from stage. I'm I'm in there. You know what I mean? It's almost like like we saw fucking Iron Man today, and it's like a suit I get to put on and go out there and knock people on their asses, you know. But that's in me, like it'll slip. You know, sometimes where I have to watch myself, you know, I'll be a huge dick to someone off stage, like thinking it's funny. Part of the fun is seeing where that line is and where you can cross it. I think this description of his onstage persona is quite interesting, and the Iron Man analogy seems really fitting when you consider how polite he is off stage and how much he pivots when he's in the middle of his act. There's also an interesting piece of advice Anthony gives later on in this video that I really feel compelled to highlight. Here it is. Ronnie Dangerfield is and you know a number one and said his advice was be a tank be a tank if the crowd is not that into you keep doing your act go straight ahead you're driving that motherfucker and these guys can't do anything to stop you because you never know who's going to come in in the last 10 minutes you never know like if they're going to get something later on just don't bail 
be a tank. It's interesting to me that despite them butting heads at Last Comic Standing, both Norm Macdonald and Anthony Jeselnik both have a deep appreciation for Rodney Dangerfield and the absolute masterclass of a performance he put on anytime he did stand-up comedy. The be a tank advice is one of my favorite parts of this video because a lot of comedians have a plan B so that they can pivot accordingly just in case the crowd doesn't enjoy their act, but Anthony does not do that. So if you don't know who you came to see, like what you're talking about, that's in your problem now, you know? Mm -hmm. well, you came to see a movie and yeah. you're yeah. going to see the movie. Yeah, like, see I'm not the gonna, movie. I'm exactly. not going to change the movie mm -hmm. no. because somebody's not having a good, because you brought too many kids. Yeah. You right. know, like it's a rated R movie. Anthony refuses to adjust his act, especially now that he is an established comedian who sells out theaters. But even in his early days, he never ever changed who he was for anyone and just continued to be the antagonistic joke machine we've all come to know and love. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with comedians who will adjust their act in the moment based on the crowd reaction, but there's different strokes for different folks, and there's pros and cons to each approach a comedian can take. One of my friends got to open for Anthony Jeselnik back when he was still doing comedy clubs, and he told my friend when it came to writing jokes, Anthony said, quote, do the ones that you love and keep the ones that they love, end quote. This quote is great because it infers that Anthony is always doing jokes he likes, and when the crowd likes it, he can always do jokes he personally enjoys doing and also do well at comedy. Furthermore, given this attitude and work ethic Anthony had when he was coming up, it was only a matter of time before he got his big break and started to really become an established name. Then in 2006, around four to five years into his comedy career, Anthony had some credits surrounding his name and he would receive the opportunity to make an appearance on the TV series titled Premium Blend. Premium Blend was a stand-up comedy series created by Paul Miller and had featured many successful names in comedy while they were still making their mark, such as Daniel Tosh, Mitch Hedberg, Mike Birbiglia, Gabriel Iglesias, and so many more. This would allow Anthony to show how hard he'd been working over the last five years years as a stand-up comedian and also allow him to network with some other legendary names in comedy. Then just two years later in 2008, Jim Norton would see Anthony Jeselnik perform and invite him to do his HBO series titled Down and Dirty. The set he performed is actually available to be viewed on YouTube and it's a great watch because you get to see a young Anthony Jeselnik start to sit in and enjoy his dark on stage persona. His opening joke in this set I had never seen him tell before when I first watched the set. My family is exactly like the Brady Bunch. We may not be perfect, but my father did die from AIDS. Anyway, this was a great connection and opportunity for Anthony because through Jim Norton, he would start to meet other comedians who were regulars and veterans in the New York City comedy scene at the time, such as Colin Quinn, Bobby Kelly, and Craig Robinson. He had never met Patrice O'Neill, but we will discuss their first time meeting a little bit later in the video. Then just a year later in 2009, Anthony would perform a half hour special for Comedy Central Presents. This was another huge step for Anthony because he was following the path many comedians took in their career when they started to become a established, which was performing on Comedy Central as a TV credit. He was named one of Comedy Central's breakout comedians of the year. A lot of comedians such as TJ Miller, Donald Glover, Dave Attell, Nick Swartzen, and so many more took this step, and it would lead to bigger and better things in all of their careers. Most of the material he did on this Comedy Central half hour we would then see again when he recorded his first full comedy album titled Shakespeare, which would take place later in 2010. However, before that, Anthony would pick up another one of his major credits very early in his career in 2009 when he joined the staff at Late Night with Jimmy Fallon as a writer. Originally before getting into stand-up comedy, this was Anthony's dream writing job. However, when he started doing comedy, he realized how much more fun it was to write your own jokes and then perform them on stage rather than just writing for somebody else's voice. Anthony would then move from Los Angeles to New York City in this time period, and after working in the writer's room of Late Night during the day, he would do stand-up comedy in the evenings. After working hard and establishing himself in a new world of comedy, Anthony would get passed at the legendary comedy seller and become a regular there. Despite all the money Anthony was making with his New York City run, he was very unhappy. One of the main reasons he was unhappy was because he realized that writing for Jimmy Fallon was not all that it was cracked up to be in his head. The reason for that was because despite being a comedy powerhouse in the writer's room, a lot of Anthony's jokes would be rejected because they were way too dark. He actually talks about this on the Your Mom's House podcast as well and how much it sucked for him. They knew I was funny. Like I thought I was going to get fired every 13 weeks as you can fire a writer. Uh -huh. So I'm like, I'm not getting anything on. Like Jimmy would be like, I can't say this joke. But I was the funny guy in the room. Like it was right. all Harvard people. And then like Morgan Murphy and me were like the two comedians. So we were the funniest ones in the room, but our stuff never got on. That's hilarious. But they were, when I finally quit, they were like, we would have never fired you. Like we loved you and you really? were part of the family. Yeah. 
So Jimmy really liked Anthony as a writer and thought his jokes were funny, but given that the job of a late night host is to be likable, he found it very difficult to do any of Anthony's jokes without jeopardizing that aura of likability and charm on stage. Some of the highlights of this move for Anthony though were really getting to fully tighten the screws of his writing and also get used to the writing process of writing a bunch of different jokes in a day. Additionally, as a writer, he received two opportunities from within to appear as a stand-up comedian on Jimmy's Late Night Show. This was yet another chance for Anthony to show the world what he was made of as a comedian and why his new style of dark deadpan misdirection was cutting edge. Then in March 2010, around a year after he received the writing job, Anthony would approach the producers of Late Night and Jimmy himself and tell them he was thankful for the opportunity but that he didn't feel like he belonged on the show. The team understood Anthony's feelings and they encouraged him to go out into the world and enjoy being Anthony Jeselnik. After leaving Late Night, he would then tape his debut comedy album Shakespeare in New York City, and upon its release, the reviews would all be incredibly positive and supportive. People loved this comedy album, and this would continue to establish Anthony as a dominant force in the world of comedy coming up. Then in 2011, he would do Just for Laughs, located in Montreal, Canada, where he would continue to build his status as a comedian even more so. After nearly 10 years of working hard and putting his nose to the grindstone, Anthony had made a serious dent in the world of comedy. The best part was he wasn't even close to finishing. In fact, the following year, he would take part in something that would proceed to take his career to the very next level and give him his big break. This was where more people than ever before would find out about Anthony Jeselnik. We get some rules to Later in 2010, Anthony Jeselnik would begin writing for the Comedy Central Roasts. The first roast he would contribute to was the Roast of David Hasselhoff. Anthony has said on numerous occasions how much he loves roasts, and how he thinks it's a great exercise for writing as a stand-up comedian. He actually talks about this quite a bit. I just think it's like the way to go, you know what I mean? You might as well just be <laughs> crazy vicious. And I don't even really make fun of people that much, I kind of take like a jumping off point to, to make like some AIDS joke or something, you know, I just try to say the most offensive thing I can. And then that usually works because it's pretty funny. Yeah. You gotta have the right audience. Well, the roast but, audiences is the best. Yeah, you yeah. can get away with anything on this. Anything. Yeah. Oh, what is it? Why can't all comedy audiences be like that? Everybody gets offended. My audiences are like that. Love your audience. Furthermore, Anthony Jeselnik would excel in writing for the Comedy Central roasts, given his excellent word economy and his punchlines almost always having a razor-sharp edge to them. He did so well that the executives at Comedy Central would approach him and offer him the opportunity to perform at the very next roast, which in this case was the roast of Donald Trump. Absolutely perfect timing for Anthony. Of course he would accept the offer, and then when the time came, Anthony would go down in history as the most vicious roaster on the night of the roast of Donald Trump. He said in an interview that he had no idea how much meaner he was going to be than everyone else, and that it really made him stand out, given that being his brand of comedy. He wasn't kidding either. I'm not typically a big fan of Comedy Central roasts. In fact, there's only two Comedy Central roasts I go back and watch routinely, but if there had to be a king of writing mean jokes about people for these shows, Jesselnik is certainly a contender for the number one spot. Listen to some of these roasts. But the only difference between you and Michael Douglas from the movie Wall Street is that no one's gonna be sad when you get cancer. Charlie, you are a monster. You've convinced more women to have abortions than the prenatal test for Down syndrome. <laughs> This was exactly on par with Jeselnik's brand of humor. Anthony has also said that the moments leading up to and following the roast of Donald Trump was one of the best times in his life because he had not yet become a household name in comedy, but he knew this was going to be his big moment to shine and show the world who he really was as a stand-up comic. He recalls no one knowing who he was, and then literally the day after, his life had evolved and changed forever. While Jeselnik had been headlining comedy clubs and had written for Jimmy Fallon, the roasts were the perfect way for him to break because it essentially took his very dark and amoral style of comedy and essentially grandfathered him into the limelight. All the years of bombing because people didn't get his style being so dark were finally over. Now people knew who Anthony Jeselnik was as a comedian and that's who they were paying to see live. After the positive reception to his performance at the roast of Donald Trump, Comedy Central would make a big offer to Anthony which included an hour-long comedy special and two more Comedy Central roasts. Anthony would accept this offer and the next two roasts would be the roast of Charlie Sheen in 2011 and the roast of Roseanne Barr in 2012. I want to focus on the roast of Charlie Sheen. You guys probably know exactly where I'm going with this. It has some of my favorite moments of any roast on it. First of all, there's a Mike Tyson joke that Anthony was going to tell, but it was ultimately cut from the final taping of the roast. I will show you a clip of him telling the joke in an interview because to me, it's pretty damn funny. Uh, one of them was, uh, I think Mike Tyson's biggest problem 
is that Mike never had a strong male role model growing up. You know, Mike's dad walked out on the family very early on uh, after Mike raped him. And I just, I mean, the image of a baby Mike Tyson raping his own father uh, really cracked me up. Freaking hilarious joke. I actually found out about this joke because Anthony tells a story about this getting cut in his new hour and you will all get to hear that when it's released. But this joke was just so funny to me. Also, we can't do a deep dive on Anthony Jeselnik without talking about the best time he ever got roasted by Patrice O'Neill. Patrice was actually outwardly supportive while Anthony was on stage and you could audibly hear him say several times, that's a great joke. Holy Christ, you're fat. You look like you deep fry your hands before you bite your fingernails. That's a good joke. What can you say about Mike Tyson that hasn't already been the title of a Richard Pryor album? <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. You got it. So Patrice gives him some props, but then proceeds to cut his legs out from under him and tear him to shreds when he's doing the roast. I'll show a little bit of it here. Like, I wasn't gonna be mean to Anthony. I, I don't know him, I never met him. Like, like, so I'm sitting here watching him and I'm like, he has way too much confidence. Like in my world, he's an open micer. Nobody knows him and nobody should. Like nobody should fucking know Anthony. Uh, I refuse to learn his last shitty name. He reminds me of a medieval restaurant waiter. Like his old demeanor, like, hello, may I welcome to, and you just want to go shut the fuck up and bring me my giant turkey leg, you fucking nothing. Absolutely hilarious. I think Patrice's roast of everyone here is one of the best, and it will certainly get its own video at some point. As much as I love Anthony, it was funny to see him get roasted by one of the greatest comedians to ever live, and he took it right on the cheek. I'm sure Anthony had a great respect for Patrice. He had to because there was so much of Patrice to respect, because he's a big fat guy. After the roast, there was actually a really funny appearance that Anthony had made on Fox 5 News when he was doing a show at the American Comedy Company located in San Diego, California. He was asked about the roast, and when they went on to show footage of the roast for Charlie Sheen, this happened. To Charlie Sheen? Yeah. Because you did his roast at the height of his, whatever you want to call it. Meltdown. Yeah. Let's watch. Right. Anthony, we're literally watching you because we couldn't hear a word you said. Can you repeat something that you said about Charlie Sheen? I don't even remember that. This is a great operation you guys are running here, by the way. <laughs> yeah, say that. I don't know how you screwed that up. <laughs> Someone had to hit play. So then Anthony was asked if he could overdub the audio since it wasn't working, and he proceeded to tear apart the entire show in a spectacularly funny fashion. Here's a snippet of it. You want me to overdub? See? Oh, you want to do that? <laughs> if we, if he can recreate the SVU Donald, uh, the Charlie Sheen thing, and we play the video with no audio. Yeah, go can... ahead. Okay, go, go ahead, ahead. play it again. Charlie Sheen, every minute of your life is like watching Fox 5 News in the morning. <laughs> it's completely worthless. Go see me at the American Comedy Company, 7 and 9.30. You idiots. <laughs> If you want to see the full appearance, I'd recommend watching it if you're a fan of anything comedy or Anthony Jeselnik in particular. In sum, the Comedy Central roasts were an amazing opportunity for Anthony because he got to show off his dark and antagonistic style of comedy in an outlet where people really valued that energy. This newfound audience Anthony had and his working relationship with Comedy Central would lead to him getting yet another big opportunity on the network where even more people could enjoy what Anthony had to offer. With Anthony Jeselnik hitting his big break after the Comedy Central roasts and a successful debut special back in 2010, his stock was at an all-time high and the people now more than ever wanted more Anthony Jeselnik content by any means necessary. When he signed his deal with Comedy Central, one of the projects he was promised was his highly anticipated hour-long comedy special titled Caligula. But in addition to that, Anthony would also get his very own TV show titled The Jeselnik Offensive. The show was set to take place four nights a week directly after the the Colbert Report, and the Jeselnik Offensive would air its very first episode on February 19th, 2013. In the early stages of the show with its pilot, Anthony felt incredibly out of place interviewing celebrities similar to that of a late night talk show, so the show would pivot and mainly focus on monologues, remotes, sketch comedy, and audience participation games. The show is often described as a mix of a late night talk show and a podcast. Think Tosh.0, but radically more edgy and antagonistic. The show, similar to Anthony Jeselnik's style, was filled with amoral jabs for punchlines, dark and demented twists, and absurd humor. You said your dad is a soldier fighting overseas, and you haven't seen him in eight months. 
<laughs> we got a surprise for you. Are you ready? Yes! <laughs> surprise! <laughs> Anthony saw the show as an opportunity to take dark jokes that were similar to what he would often write for Jimmy Fallon and actually perform them given it being Anthony's signature style on stage. The show was shot at Hollywood Center Studios located within Los Angeles, California. The show's format would often run as follows. Anthony would come out on stage and start the night with a fierce monologue that often was doused in tragedy and dark malignant humor in typical Jeselnik fashion. Then this would be followed with either a late night style remote or a game that Anthony plays where he picks volunteers from the crowd. There were several different segments that Anthony would rotate on the Jeselnik offensive, including Defend Your Tweet, Sacred Cow, and Which Kind of Asian Is This? Defend Your Tweet was a humorous segment where a guest would be asked to defend something offensive or unsavory they said in the past. Sacred Cow focused on a taboo topic that many believed you couldn't make jokes about, while Jeselnik proceeded to do exactly that, and Which Kind of Asian Is This? is pretty self-explanatory. Then at the end of each episode, Anthony and the guests would look back at the best moments of this installment of the show, and then conclude the episode with his signature catchphrase being, Good night, kids. Go read a book. While the show seemed like an exceptional idea given Jeselnik's style of comedy becoming increasingly more popular, in the beginning it was not easy for Anthony and the team to get network executives on board with airing episodes. For example, on the first episode, there was a segment where Anthony Jeselnik did stand-up comedy full of cancer jokes for a cancer support group. First of all, I don't think cancer really needs any more support with how many people it kills. Second of all, the network given the incredibly edgy nature of the sketch, was hesitant to air the episode. Luckily, Anthony was able to convince them to do it. The first season of the show did incredibly well with ratings and received a lot of positive reception from comedy fans. The show would also feature a regular rotation of different guests, often comedians. Some of the comedians featured on the show were Aziz Ansari, Nick Kroll, John Mulaney, TJ Miller, and so many more. Despite a successful first season, the show would start to struggle with ratings in the second season. On top of that, Anthony was threatened with the cancellation of the show on a whim. How this manifested itself was on the day of the Boston Marathon bombing, he would tweet out this joke. Comedy Central saw this and threatened to cancel the show if he didn't take down the tweet, and against his principles, Anthony folded and took the joke down because he didn't want to put his peers out of work over a joke. This was just two months into the filming of the show, so I understand why Anthony didn't want to sabotage it so early. Unfortunately, the show would only air one more season, and the last episode would go live on August 27, 2013. The reason for the show's cancellation is cited as poor ratings by network executives. Despite the show's cancellation, it would prove its point and it continued to demonstrate the comedic powerhouse of Anthony Jeselnik, even treading the deepest and darkest waters of comedy. This was the era of the Jeselnik Offensive. <laughs> Anthony Jeselnik has a relatively addicting style of comedy to watch online. However, it can be hard to find a lot of new information about him and his comedy online when he's not actively promoting himself or posting new content. However, in October 2015, he began a regular installment of a podcast titled The Rosenthal and Jeselnik Vanity Project, which is hosted by him and Greg Rosenthal, who is a fellow alumni of Tulane University. The format of RJVP typically involves Rosenthal and Jeselnik sharing humorous banter, discussing recent and events in the world of sports, and often delving into more offbeat and irreverent topics. The podcast has since gained a cult following for its sharp wit, unfiltered commentary, and the undeniable chemistry between Anthony and Greg. Obviously, given Anthony's stature as a comedian and his brand of tackling sacred topics in his act, RJVP is not afraid to tackle controversial or taboo topics. The hosts often offer unfiltered commentary on current events, sports, and pop culture, which can be refreshing for listeners that are tired of sanitized content content, often with little to no edge given the nature of monetized content and advertisements not being allowed to monetize discussion of said topics. Despite the irreverent tone, Anthony and Greg provided insightful commentary on various subjects in the wide world of sports. Whether it's sports, politics, or personal anecdotes, their perspectives offer a unique blend of comedy and insight. You would think that given Anthony's style of quick rapid-fire jokes, that he might not thrive as well on a longer form style of content, but Anthony proved this idea wrong on the show. Listeners appreciated the authenticity of Anthony and Greg, they often come across as genuine and unapologetically themselves, which fosters a connection with their audience. On a bonus note, in September 2018, Jeselnik returned to Comedy Central, signing a multi-platform
long-form development deal which included new episodes of JRVP and by producer and NFL Network director Erica Tamposi. So Anthony and Greg took the show from just a regular podcast to a much more profitable endeavor through their consistency and the credibility behind both of their names on top of all of that. On a side note, just a year later, Anthony Jeselnik would also land another project on Comedy Central for the show Good Talk with Anthony Jeselnik, where he would interview many comedians such as David Spade, Kumal Nanjiani, Mick Kroll, and many more. It would seem that Anthony Jeselnik would dominate longer form styles of content in addition to being one of the best one-liner comedians working. From his podcast with Greg to his talk show, Anthony Jeselnik saw a lot of success from his established brand as a stand-up comedian. Stand-up comedy is certainly Anthony Jeselnik's bread and butter. For over 20 years, Anthony has been grinding stand-up comedy and has learned the ins and outs of how to make people laugh. So along with that comes an incredibly high-quality discography of many great comedy specials. Anthony Jeselnik currently has four comedy specials that are all absolutely hilarious and brilliant in their own way. Anthony's current specials include Shakespeare, Caligula, Thoughts and Prayers, and Fire in the Maternity Ward. Shakespeare is available to be heard on YouTube and was digitally released by Comedy Central Records. Caligula was recorded live and is available to be viewed on Comedy Central, and then Thoughts and Prayers and Fire in the Maternity Ward are both available to be viewed on Netflix. Unlike children, I believe Anthony has another one on the way. He's currently wrapping up his Bones and All tour, and I presume this special will be released sometime later this year. Out of these specials, my favorite two are without a doubt Caligula and Thoughts and Prayers. First of all, Caligula is everything Anthony Jeselnik is best at. He starts the special by coming out and immediately telling his first joke, which is a joke about grape. He does it in a way, too, where you know something bad is going to happen, but you can't quite put your finger on how he's going to fool you. This is why I call him a dark magician. When you watch Anthony set up a joke, it's like you're watching a magician doing a card trick, except the ending is much, much darker. The entire time you're watching him do it, you feel helpless, and no matter how hard you try, you just can't follow along with him. Then when the punchline hits, you realize you just watch someone who is a master of their craft fool you from start to finish. However, if you hear the joke a second time, it never quite hits the same way it did that first time, just like when watching a magic trick. This isn't to say Anthony's jokes can't be funny a second or third listen, but just that the initial flair and power of the joke will never quite surprise you the way it did the first time. Anyway, Anthony soldiers on through his act, just throwing out one-liner after one-liner, and along the way he does some funny crowd work where even though he's asking the audience members questions, he's in control every single second of the set. Some comedians will walk around the stage just to keep the attention of the audience, but every single step Anthony takes is calculated and with the sole purpose of keeping you under his hypnotic trance. Anthony treads every dark topic you can think of, and by the end of it you're wishing it was longer and that you could hear another dark joke. George Carlin once said that he believes a comedian's job should be to find the line that's acceptable and then deliberately cross it to where the audience isn't sure how it's going to go, and then the real magic is by the end of it, they're happy that you took them there. I think Anthony demonstrates this perfectly in Caligula. The next special is Thoughts and Prayers. What I find fascinating about this special is that it has every single element of what I mentioned in Caligula, but to me it goes a little deeper than the last special for one reason. When you watch Jeslinik's act, you become aware very quickly that none of the jokes he tells are true because the absurd or amoral punchline exists solely for the surprise of the audience. However, at the end of Thoughts and Prayers, Anthony dives into a real-life story of the time when a joke almost lost him his television show, The Jeslinik Effect. What's unique about this is that it's all completely true and well documented, so you know that every time he makes you laugh when he's talking about it, the punchline comes from a completely real place. You guys ever tell a joke and then get death threats? Well, I guess that's what makes me me. <laughs> and they're like, Anthony, we've got some terrible news, please sit down. You say you were getting a lot of death threats online from New Zealand because of Shark Party. And I was like, really? New Zealand wants to kill me? That's weird because they didn't even kill the shark. <laughs> I think one of the biggest complaints about Anthony's style of comedy that people have is that he can be seen as a one-trick pony that doesn't really confide in the audience or tell them a lot about himself that's interesting, but I think in Thoughts and Prayers he's able to expand past his one-liner style with some meta-commentary about a story that's very important to him. With so many comedians dominating the field of stand-up comedy, a lot of people believe that you should really, really let the audience know who you are, and that helps you to build an audience. Even though this section is on Thoughts and Prayers, we also see this 
Jason fire in the maternity ward at the end when he tells a story about the time he took his friend to get an abortion. I firmly believe that this type of commentary and storytelling that Anthony has added to his comedy and joke telling has made him a much better practitioner of his craft because he takes what he's already so gifted at being his joke telling and adds an additional element to it that keeps the audience on their toes. When I saw him live recently, he shared plenty of stories that were very personal to him, including the time he worked on Last Comic Standing with Norm MacDonald, which I have an entire video about that you should check out after this video, also the time he was writing jokes for the roast of Donald Trump and Mike Tyson. I firmly believe with this extra tool in his arsenal, it makes Anthony an even more powerful comedic force, and that he started doing this more in thoughts and prayers when talking about Shark Party. In sum, these are my favorite specials by Anthony Jeselnik and why I think his style is so deeply unique. Anthony Jeselnik has certainly had a very big impact on the world of stand-up comedy. I would say he's one of the most influential comedians working today, and many young comedians cite him as a contemporary, such as Mark Norman, Sam Morrell, and many more. With his many years of experience, Anthony has taken the one-liner joke-teller style of comedy and turned it into a heel character that, despite being antagonistic in nature, is still somehow very likable and hypnotic to watch. Some people have complained about some of his actions along the way, such as the time he trashed Shane Gillis after his firing from SNL, or the dispute he had with Tim Dillon and the Legion of Skanks, or dating Amy Schumer. But aside from those stories, which will absolutely get their own video at some point in the future, Anthony is a solid comedian who has paid his dues and proved beyond a shadow of a doubt why he deserves to be as successful as he is in the world of comedy. Through his deep knowledge of English literature and the English language, his many hours of trial, error, and repetition, his two decades of experience performing stand-up comedy, and his plethora of experiences writing for television shows and doing Comedy Central roasts, Anthony Jeselnik has certainly carved a very unique path for himself, and with a unique path comes a very compelling story. With all of that said, this has been Anthony Jeselnik, Comedy's Dark Magician. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching the video all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. Anthony Jeselnik is one of my favorite comedians working today, so I really wanted to cover why I think his style is so unique and interesting to me in this video, and I think I did a pretty decent job of doing so. If you want to help the channel out, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications down below, because that's a free way to support the channel, and you're helping the community grow brick by brick, one subscriber at a time, every time one of you guys subscribes. I really want the YouTube family to hit 100,000 subscribers this year, and I think we could do that, so please help me out by subscribing to the channel right now. If you want to support the channel further, you can check out my Patreon page down below where you get some exclusive benefits, like you get to see recent sets I did at comedy clubs, you get to see every video early before it comes out, you get shout outs every single video, and you also get to play a direct leading hand in the direction my channel takes. Real quick, I want to give a shout out to Ethan, Jason Murray, Crossblocker, Thomas Gill, Karsten, and also Eduardo Ramos, Celia Ellis. Darren Lester, I appreciate you guys so much for subscribing to the Patreon. Thank you. But yeah, I hope you guys love the video. Make sure you take care of yourselves, your friends, your families, and your loved ones. I love you, and I will see you in the next video. Take care.